picture of the Creole building on the University of Central Florida campus where I am not now, I am actually sitting at the beach. So here's, here's where Creole is and I'm sitting right, uh, right here. Uh, on the beach in, in Cape Canaveral where we get to watch the rockets go up. But actually much more exciting now is we get to watch the boosters come back down and land. It's really quite a remarkable experience. If you ever get to Florida, you should watch one of those launches. We're now up to about one a week. So good fun. So let me uh, go back in, in a bit of history here. Um, when the beginnings of nonlinear optics, when people were making measurements, very simple measurements. You come in with a beam into a sample. You monitor how much energy goes in. You monitor how much energy gets through. There are lots of experiments done this way. And let me just show uh, a little bit, and I'm gonna talk about semiconductors for a while, uh, where instead of having one photon get you from the valence to conduction band, you have two photons that simultaneously get absorbed. And then the IDZ, rather than being minus alpha I, is minus alpha 2I squared. Three photon absorptions I cubed, et cetera, et cetera. Really simple theory in that respect. But my favorite view graph, here's the two photon absorption coefficient in these units of centimeters per gigawatt as a function of the year published in the literature. Um, the, uh, <laughs> this is a semi-logarithmic scale. And notice that this is for a single material, gallium arsenide, at a single wavelength of one micron. And notice how they slowly decrease in time and we get to the accepted value in the, in the, in the 90s uh, of the order of 26 centimeters per, per gigawatt. Um, and there are all sorts of different reasons for that. The laser, understanding the lasers, laser parameters, interpretation of the data being very important. And the fact is usually when you have two photon absorption, there can be other processes occurring. So let me just mention one of those. And that's nonlinear refraction. So <laughs> nonlinear refraction come in with a Gaussian beam. And if the index of refraction depends upon the irradiance, you'll have n is n0 plus n2i. Let me choose a sample where the n2 is less than zero. Uh, and we come in with this Gaussian beam and it's gonna change the optical path length here. Can you see my cursor? Hello, can you see my cursor? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Uh, and so if with a negative nonlinearity, the optical path length is actually decreased in the center and that's effectively a negative lens. And therefore the phase fronts go out here. So it goes faster in the middle than on the wings. And so when you had your detector collecting all of the beam at low irradiance, at high irradiance, some of the energy actually gets outside of the detector and makes it look like the loss is larger than it was. And you notice most, most of those experiments showed the loss larger, the two photon absorption that they calculated larger than it was. And this is one of the reasons, very simple reason, but easily to occur. And the way that you can get a negative nonlinear refraction is that when you have two photon absorption, you create free carriers, excited carriers. And you're above resonance for those carriers and that causes self defocusing. It's not an N2, it's an actually higher order nonlinearity, but it gives you this very large nonlinearity, especially for long pulses. That's part of the, one, just one of the mechanisms that causes that. So if you go back and look at, at nonlinear absorption, alpha is alpha zero plus alpha two I, and then alpha two I squared for three photon absorption, et cetera. The index goes as, as, as this, and, and then, but, if you look at this, you in, 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 in semiconductors, you create excited states. I mean, at free carriers in organic materials, you create excited states. The equations are actually the same. And then the generation for rate for those, those carriers, if you don't have linear absorption would be, for example, two photon absorption in these carriers. And if you then take these equations and solve and put in, you're gonna have absorption that depends not only on, on this eye, but depends upon the density of carriers which has an eye in it. So there's, this is a higher order nonlinearity. The index, the same thing. You get the carrier's density in here for the refractive cross-section of these, of these carriers, which is negative, as I said. And that gives you, if you integrate this over time, gives you a higher order nonlinearity. And these things occur uh, no matter what you do. What you want to do. So it's important to, to understand the, the physics of what's going on in these experiments. 
So let's just look at an example here. And I'm just going to take sodium chloride with picosecond pulses at one micron. We're just going to look in the far field on a, on a, on a camera uh, at, at relatively low irradiance here. Um, it doesn't look low, but that's, that's low for this material. And uh, here is a Gaussian beam that we input. Here is the, the, this dotted line down here shows you there's just a little aberration over here. Very nice Gaussian. And now let me turn the irradiance up. There's very little phase distortion. So from the nonlinearity, let me turn the irradiance up by over an order of magnitude. And if you do that, you see those wings came up. So low irradiance, high irradiance. And uh, if you heard Mansour's talk, I think he mentions easy scan. And notice all the action is in the wings. So the Z scan actually is looking with an aperture is looking in the far field at the center section where there's not much action. In the easy scan, you're looking at these wings and that's where the action is. That's why the easy scan is an order of magnitude more sensitive than the Z scan. So, okay, so and th these, things are, these things occur along with that. So let's just run through the Z scan uh, one more time. Um, I'm gonna take a sample with self-focusing. So N2 is, is larger than zero. Uh, I'm going to look in the far field with this aperture, and we're going to have a thin sample, and I'm going to move it through here and look at how much energy is transmitted. That's what's going to be showing down here as we move, okay? So self-focusing. So if we do this, the self-focusing makes that focus occur a little bit earlier, and then it diverges more in the far field, so there's less energy transmitted. But on the other side of focus, it tends to collimate the beam through that aperture, and you get more energy transmitted to it. That's the closed aperture Z scan uh, in a nutshell. And if you, that was for self-focusing nonlinearity, so you had a valley followed by a peak. For self-defocusing nonlinearity, you got a peak followed by a valley. And the change in transmission between peak and valley is directly proportional to that phase distortion, which if it's N2, it is directly proportional to that nonlinear refractive index. Now, let's say you also have besides the nonlinear refraction, that's self-focusing, you also have nonlinear absorption. Now, let me get rid of that aperture and have a big detector out here so I don't miss any of it. And let me do the same experiment. The sample's thin, so there's no uh, change in the, in the sample, uh, in, within the uh, propagation within the sample. And the fact that there's self-lensing here doesn't matter because you're still collecting all the energy. And then all you see is the fact that as you get toward the focus, you see this nonlinear absorption, for example, two photon absorption. And so nicely, however, and this is really a, a really nice feature of this, and here's a, a, an example of a sample we found where we worked very hard performing multiple experiments to show that this was all just bound electronic. Here's the open aperture Z scan in black. Here's the closed aperture Z scan. You see it's trying to defocus, but the nonlinear absorption is dragging that signal down. But if we simply take this closed after Z scan and divide by the black curve, it sort of negates the effect of that nonlinear absorption, and you get a curve that looks like a, a closed after Z scan in the absence of nonlinear absorption. And it shows self defocusing, which is interesting for, a, for an organic material, but there are some organic materials that have negative bound electronic N2. Uh, I know Mansour Sheikh Baha'i explained the sensitivity of the experiment. The simplicity of the experiments, which is part of the reason there are over 9,000 citations for this technique. Uh, uh, but um, it, it, there are some things, and I'm going to spend some time. I, I mean, I love the Z scan, but I'm going to spend some time telling you what it doesn't do. It doesn't, for example, give you the temporal response. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether it's third order or, or higher order. And you really do need to do multiple experiments to verify that these are, in this case, for example, bound electron nonlinearity. So the interpretation of these experiments is, is, is important. So um, let me uh, go on from there. And the other thing is, to, if, you, if you really want to uh, uh, make sure that you have good signal to noise, it's always important to use a, uh, a reference beam uh, that's, that's configured the same way as your, as your sample beam, uh, and then reference your signal detector to your reference detector. That really cleans up the noise in these Z-scan experiments. So that's, that's good to do. So let me give you an example here where you can easily misinterpret an experiment. So here are two sets of data on a, a sample of chloroaluminum thalocyanin, sort of stuff you use on, a blue, on blue paint, 
for cars. Um, there are two, two Z scans here, two open aperture and two closed aperture Z scans. This is divided. Uh, and the energy is fixed from the, from the laser. But by putting an edelon in the cavity, we could change the pulse width by a factor of two. And we could put both, both Z scan data on the same plot. So energy fixed, pulse width changed by a factor two. Notice there are squares and triangles. Those are the two sets of data and they fall on top of each other, but the irradiance changed by a factor of two. So this cannot be two photon absorption. Um, and same thing is for the closed aperture Z scan. It cannot be a simple N2. So what is it? Well, here's the equation that, in terms of, of the fluence here, as opposed to the irradiance. So if this is my cell phone. So let me go to the next slide just to explain this. What it is, is a chi-1, chi-1 process as opposed to a chi-3 process, meaning you have a little bit of linear absorption high up in the rotational vibrational band. And then you immediately have very large excited state absorption, sometimes called reverse saturable absorption. Uh, and so here's the equation that governs that. The I to Z is minus alpha I. And then when you have these excited states, it's minus the cro absorption cross section times the density of those excited states times the irradiance. But the generation rate for those excited states goes like the linear absorption times the radiance divided by the energy it took to get you into that excited state, H bar omega. You can take these two equations and integrate them over time, ignoring decays and all these sorts of things for this particular sample that works very nicely. And you get an equation that looks very much like the, the equation for two photon absorption, but it gives you this density in the ground state times the product of the cross section of absorption cross section for the ground state, where sigma g n g is alpha, the linear absorption curve times the excited state cross section divided by the two photons, one, two, that took you to get there, times the square of the fluence. Very similar to this equation, but it doesn't depend upon the time, the pulse width. So uh, it's a fluence dependent energy per unit area as opposed to energy per unit area per unit time. So the excited state absorption chi one, chi one mimics chi three. And if you had only done one pulse width, you would have calculated a two photon absorption coefficient in N2 and you would have been wrong. So doing that, uh, it's very important to understand the physics of what's going on. Here's some Z scans, old Z scans, uh, uh, I think Von Stewart did these, um, of zinc selenide, open aperture, closed aperture, divided. Uh, and what's happening here is it's not just, uh, in fact, it's the N2 was, was very small in this. It's dominated by the defocusing from the, from the photo generated of uh, free carriers in here. And these fits are for all of these equations, which you cannot solve analytically, but you've got the I squared here and the, and the linear then the linear absorption here too. So this is actually a chi three, imaginary part of chi three for two photon absorption, followed by a chi one for the linear absorption. And the sim similar sorts of things for the free carrier. Not simply chi three. And there are lots of variations on Z scan. And I still think MJ, um, I think uh, uh, Mansoor told you some of that. But I want to just show this movie a second. This is actually a, a movie because we use this white light continuum for all sorts of experiments. But what we've got here is we, we, we weakly focus our, our light beam at, at, at this is a 780 nanometer uh, times half hour into a cell filled with uh, krypton gas at a couple of atmospheres. And we produce a white light continuum. And we put about a millijoule into there. But what we've got now is a seed at, at this frequency that we created with an optical parametric device, of only one microjoule, one microjoule seed. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna vary the time delay between the seed and the pump. And notice when we're off time, zero time delay, the weak, the, the, there's a, see the weak, there's a, there, there's a, we're off time delay. There's a weak uh, white light continuum, but when we get right to zero delay, so that pump and the seed are on top of each other, we get this huge brightening of the white light continuum. We've got a lot more spectral energy density. And we can actually do Z scans with this white light continuum uh, because it's so, it's so bright. That white light continuum when it's produced, however, oftentimes has a chirp on it, meaning that the different frequencies come out at different times. 
And so you can actually do uh, an experiment here. This is an experiment on zinc sulfide at 800 nanometers, where I've really turned up the irradiance. Here's the white light continuum, but I've got a spectral filter to block this wavelength. Here's the white light continuum as a function of wavelength. This is just a picture of the beam coming through with a camera. And what we're gonna do is change the time delay between the pump and the probe here. But since the white light continuum is chirped, the different frequencies overlap in time with a pump at different temporal delays. So if we change that temporal delay, you'll see that this, where the absorption occurs changes with wavelength. And I've really got the intensity high to make, you, make this, uh, this prominent. Uh, you can see that. So as we change that temporal delay, we actually see that whole burned into the spectrum move. Now, if you look over here, uh, you'll see that the picture of the color, it, it's, it's so bright that we actually changed the color of that white light continuum from basically white to, to uh, even red when we, when we block out all the blue, the blue wavelengths. So, uh, so it's a, a neat way to do this. And it's a neat way to see that you can do spectroscopy with these uh, nonlinear spectroscopy with these white light continuums. So one of the things we want to do is just is, is this white light continuum Z scan. And the idea originally was we simply have a white light continuum source, have a spectrometer to separate things. We do a, we do a, uh, a Z scan and we get everything all at once. Uh, but it doesn't take long to realize that there's a problem with that. In fact, it doesn't work. Um, and it doesn't work for the following reason. Uh, lots of wavelengths are present in the sample simultaneously. And not only can you have two equal photons getting you to that uh, excited state, but you also uh, can have two unequal energy photons. And, and so any pair of those that gets you to the final state gives you nonlinear absorption. So you get huge nonlinear absorption, but there's no way to separate which photons gave you the nonlinearity. So you have to do something else. And what we did was something very simple. Here's the white light continuum coming in. You have all this non-degenerate uh, nonlinear absorption. And we just simply come in here and we take a spectral filter and only let one wavelength through. And so then we have degenerate uh, two photon absorption only and we can interpret the data. So here we make the white light continuum in that long cell. We have a spectral filter, a bunch of them on a big wheel. We come down here and here's the Z scan. Here's the sample uh, in, in yellow or gold. And here's the open after Z scan, closed after Z scan. So we do a Z scan, Z scan, change the spectral filter, do a Z scan, change the spectral filter. And our spectral resolution is determined by how, many, how much money we've got to buy filters. Uh, and then we can go and we can plot out. And here's, for example, a two photon absorption coefficient as a function of wavelength for uh, uh, zinc sulfide, here's zinc selenide. And here's the nonlinear refractive index from the closed aperture Z scan as a function of wavelength. And you see it going from short wavelengths where you're above the two photon absorption edge where it's negative bound electronic N2. We, we did some experiments to show that th these were really bound electronic effects using, using femtosecond pulses to positive when you're, when you're uh, below the two photon absorption band. So you get very nice spectra uh, for these materials. And I know, uh, Mansoor talked a little bit about this. I want to spend a little bit more time on this. Here's, here is the degenerate two photon absorption spectrum. Here's, here's H bar omega OE gap. So here's the linear absorption turns on at one. Two photon absorption turns on at a half. This is a theory uh, of simple two band uh, parabolic band theory uh, that we get it. And we've divided, we've multiplied, I'm sorry, by the, by the fourth, uh, by the cube of the band gap for the two photon absorption. So we can put many different materials on here. You can see it follows this reasonably well. Uh, and you can then also look at the band gap scaled nonlinear refractive index. Um, again, for a nonlinear refractive index, it's, you multiply by E gap to the fourth power. And you see this uh, well below the two photon absorption edge, merely dispersionless two photon absorption, I mean, uh, nonlinear refractive index. It has a peak near the two photon absorption edge. And then about two thirds of the gap, it actually turns negative and turns negative rapidly. Um, and it turns out that these are actually related, but in their non-degenerate form, meaning, meaning two different frequencies, uh, by chromos chronic relationships, which I know Monsieur mentioned. And so let's just go back and look at, at linear absorption. Here's the linear absorption where the linear absorption turns on where H bar omega over E gap is one. And here's the linear refractive index, normal dispersion, right? 
And above there, it actually starts turning, gets very small uh, and, and could, could get much less than, uh, than one here. And notice the similarity between one photon and two photons, right? Here's the, here's at, at this position and it turns, actually turns the nonlinear non uh, uh, refraction turns negative. So let me mention Kramer's Kronig. And I love this thing by, by John Toll back in the 50s. Here's a pulse of light, electric field going this, this way as a function of time. And you got lots of, lots of different colors that add up to give you this input pulse. I'm gonna send that input pulse to a, a material that has a very narrow absorption band. Here's alpha as a function of omega. And that in the time domain, that single absorption frequency looks like this. Now it, it tails off and it, at long times and like, but, but that's what it looks like, basically a sine wave. So I'm gonna take this input pulse and I'm gonna subtract this frequency because it gets absorbed. So this minus this is this. And it looks okay, everything's fine. And I can have the sample ringing after I've hit it. This doesn't work, however. I can't have light out before because that, that defies causality. So what did I do wrong? What I did wrong is when I subtracted this frequency, I have to make sure that I've taken into account all the different phases of these Fourier components. Because remember, how did I get this pulse to begin with? I had to have specific set of phases for every Fourier component to get a pulse. Otherwise, it's just like this incoherent light on your screen. Okay, and it's not a pulse. It's got a large bandwidth, but it does, it's not a pulse. So what I have to do is when to, to, to obey causality is I have to change uh, the phase of all the remaining Fourier components in just this way. I have to slow down those Fourier components below resonance and speed up those Fourier components just above resonance in just such a way that it cancels this precursor. And that's all Kramer's Kronig does, all right? It's causality in Kramer's Kronig. Uh, and the same thing will be true for linear, and nothing, nothing I said here was about whether it was linear loss or nonlinear loss, okay? But I have to be very careful when I do this. And then Kramer's Kronig relationships in the time domain is, is relatively trivial. Here's the polarization in Maxwell's equation. It's just the integral of the response function or the susceptibility in time times the electric field. But that response function was zero before you hit it. So the response function of the function of time is itself times a step function because it's zero before you hit it. There's no response, there's no polarization until you hit it. And what you have to do is Fourier transform. So when you Fourier transform this product, it turns into a convolution in, in the frequency domain. And of course, this real function of the response function in time turns into a complex function. And then you can do the math and you get, and it looks horrible when you, when you do that because the, the math is, is messy and you gotta take principal values and everything. But in the time domain, causality in Kramer's Kronig is, is, is trivial. And you can do exactly the same thing for third order polarization, but, the susceptibility now has these three step functions. In order to linearize this thing, basically you throw away data, you throw away these two, or you throw away those two, or these two, or any combination. But let me just, it, it, that's, that's kind of complicated, but you can think about this much more simply in the following way. Here's the degenerate two photons. So the IDG is minus alpha two, omega, omega, I squared. Two photons are the same frequency. But if I use a pump and a probe, the change in the probe is minus alpha two I excite times I probe. Now I have two different frequencies. But don't worry about that factor. Two just makes things work when you take the limit of omega P equals omega E. Non-degenerate nonlinearity. But let me re recast this. The I probe dz is minus two alpha two I E times I P. This is linear absorption as far as the probe is concerned because this is just a new linear absorption coefficient, all right? So you can apply Kramer's Kronig to this system because this you've just dressed the system with the excitation beam. The same thing goes for the for nonlinear refractive index. So really, Kramer's Kronig works beautifully for nonlinear optics if you do it right, all right? And so you just treat this as a new changed uh, nonlinear absorption or changed nonlinear refraction. So while I, what I showed you was, this was the degenerate, what we did was we generalized it to the non-degenerate case, did the Kramer's Kronig relations, 
And after having done the Kramers chronic relationship, we let omega E equal omega P, and then we could do this nice relation and, and show these uh, show these properties. And it works beautifully well. And after you've done that, you can then do a, a slightly different plot. No, notice what, what concluded into this is after we got the Z scan, we could do Z scans of when, when there was lots of two photon absorption because we could separate them. And so when we did zinc selenide at one micron and then zinc selenide at a half micron, and we made sure it was the, it was the bound electronic response, we could then uh, see that it turned negative. And that, that clued us in that Kramer's chronic was, was working. And then if you take the non refractive index and you divide by this dispersion function that we, we calculated for two parabolic bands, you can then show the one over E gap to the fourth dependence on a log log plot, which is what that line is. And it even, it's beautiful, it works, not only works for all those semiconductors, which are in black uh, over here, but it works for even glass, as is SiO2, as lithium fluoride. It's really quite impressive that it works uh, so simply for all these different materials. And it also tells you what experiment you want to do. The experiment is really simple. You come in with an excitation beam at a fixed frequency. That changes the properties of the sample. And then you probe it with a white light continuum. And so you immediately get, for example, for the two photon absorption, you'll pick out one photon from the excitation beam and then a photon, one of the colors of the, of the probe gets absorbed. And you see that like, just like that movie I showed you, uh, showed that two photon absorption spectrum. So, Nice, nice way to do things. Um, and, uh, and I mentioned the Z scan doesn't give you the temporal response, but there's another simple experiment that gives you the temporal response, and that's the usual excite probe experiment, where you vary the time delay between the, the pump and, and, and the probe. And for example, this is gallium arsenide, where you have two photon absorption at 1550. The two photon absorption just follows the uh, cross correlation of the excite and probe. But then you see these carriers that you've excited in the sample. As you turn the irradiance up, you see more and more carriers, and those carriers last for nanoseconds. So you basically you end up with these this just the linear absorption from those carriers at, at long times, and there are fits there to the data. So it's a nice a nice way to do that temporal resolution. Uh, and we'd really like to have a, a, an equally simple method for doing the nonlinear refraction. Uh, and I'll show that in a minute, but I'll, I'll first go to this. The, the first way we did that was with a, uh, a two color or time resolved Z scan experiment, where we come in with a pump and the probe into a Z scan experiment. And we only look at the probe with a, fil with a spectral filter here or cross polarizations, which I'll show in a second. And you can do that time, res time resolution. But it sounds like a, a terrible experiment because you, you got to. You got to every Z, every Z position, you had to do a, a temporal a delay, and that would take you forever. But all you really have to do, uh, if you're looking at th third order, is, is you simply set yourself at the peak of the, of the uh, uh, Z scan, scan the time at the valley of the Z scan, scan the time, and then take the subtraction of the two sets of data, and that's the delta T peak minus valley, and plot those. And here it is. Here's the nonlinear absorption for three different input irradiances, and you see those carriers start to build up. And here's the divided uh, Z scan uh, data for those uh, for that delta TPV for three, those three different irradiances. And you can see that the, the, here's the two photon absorption for the that's easy to see in the carriers. And for the nonlinear refraction, you see how the carriers really dominate uh, the nonlinearity uh, for these, uh, even for a femtosecond pulse. So, a, a nice way to do it. I just want to mention this one experiment because I really liked it that Frank Wise did using this time resolved Z scan. And he separated the beams not by freak, by color but by by polarization. And this is on a sample of a germanium gallium sulfide glass done with the Corning people, uh, and with with uh, 35 femtosecond pulses. And here's the the bound electronic response just follows the cross correlation. But in glasses or, or other materials, you have also a Raman, a nuclear contribution to the nonlinear refractive index. And you actually see that, that there's this very nice peak in the Raman spectrum for this glass. And so you see this oscillatory behavior after you hit it with a, a basic a delta function pulse. And that sample starts ringing uh, with, with, uh, with vibrations, with phonons, if you want. And you see that, uh, those coherent phonons coming out. It's a nice, uh, nice experiment for directly measuring the nonlinear fraction of, of glasses. Unfortunately, he didn't do a few silica, which I'd like to see done. It's never been, in fact, I, I, there's still real questions about how big this effect is in fused silica. So here's the other thing I want to talk about. 
Uh, that's another direct measurement of the nonlinear fraction uh, that I, I really like. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to say I like it more than Z-scan, but uh, it gives you it gives you complementary information plus plus the temporal response, and it's also it's also quite a simple experiment. So you come into the material with an excitation beam. We make sure you have very nice, clean Gaussian beams. Here's your excitation beam uh, in red. And then we come with a probe, but now we probe, we, the probe we make smaller in space. And then we don't put in the center, we put it over the wings of the beam. We borrowed this technique from photothermal beam deflection experiment. Um, and, and we make it small. And so it's sitting here where the induced index gradient is largest. Well, basically, so when you come in here, when the, when the excitation beam is on and they're temporarily overlapped, you have a prism. You go through that prism, the probe beam gets deflected. And then on these beautiful quad cells that are in every atomic force microscope, they've got built-in differential amplifiers and they're really nice. You, you can see that that beam moves just by taking the energy in the top minus the energy in the bottom, delta E over E. And that's the delta E over E in this thing where the E is the, the sum of those four is directly proportional to the nonlinear phase shift. Very simple, very simple uh, an analogy to the Z-scan that this is the same sort of signal you get from Z-scan, but now you can do temporal delay, all right? And here's fused silica. And you can also do look at the polarization dependence. This is parallel polarizations. This is perpendicular for a bound electronic chitre. It should be three to one, you see three to one. For a sample that does that, that has other nonlinearities, other nuclear nonlinearities, particularly rotational amount like here's carbon disulfide, you can do parallel, perpendicular, magic angle, and I want to talk about this in a second. And we've been able to see better than lambda over twenty thousand. What's lambda? Here, here's showing you a uh, uh, lambda over twenty thousand. That's the red. The signal noise is bigger than one, so we can see better than, than lambda over twenty thousand. Um, and you know, that, that's 0.4 angstrom optical path length change. That's much less than the Bohr radius. So it's pretty incredible that you're doing that. Of course, you're averaging over the many, many molecules, many atoms and like the so, so surface. So uh, it's not as good as the LIGO, but, <laughs> but, but it's pretty darn good. Lambda over 20,000. So it's, it's nice. So let's look at this. Here's transient nonlinear fraction in carbon disulfide. Here's parallel polarizations. Um, and so what you're doing is here you've got this CS2 molecule, cigar-shaped molecule, and the electrons are sort of bound to move back and forth along this line because they can't go perpendicular to that. Here's the double bonds, and electrons can move back and forth. So you apply that electric field, and it tends to apply a torque to this molecule. So when the electric field is in this direction, it applies a torque, P cross E, and that P cross E tends to align those molecules toward that electric field. So here's the polarization, it tends to align it. Now, when the electric field goes in the other direction, these electrons can move to the other side. And so then the, 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 it actually has the torque in the same direction for your half cycle later. So it's always trying to align those molecules, all right? So, so if you probe in the direction where they've been aligned, you, 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 the polarizability is bigger in this direction. So the change in index is positive. So you see it's always positive. Here's, here, this is a, there's a combination of bound electronic and the reorientation, and it's always positive. However, if I look in the in the other direction, I, I make the probe perpendicular. Then when they're lined up, the polarizability in this direction, perpendicular to that cigar, is smaller, and so it lowers that refractive index, and so it goes negative. But look, it's trying to go positive. That's the bound electronic response. This is the reorientation response. They're fighting each other. If it's positive in one angle, it's negative in another, somewhere in between it's zero. And that's called the magic angle. The magic angle is the three-dimensional analog of 45 degrees. So 45 degrees is the, is the bisector of a square here. But this is a cube. You go from one corner to the other corner and that angle is like uh, 54.7 degrees or something like that. And at that angle, as many molecules are rotating into that direction, as are rotating out of that direction. And you only see the ultra-fast nonlinear from here. You don't see any of that rotation. And you can now fit those. You got three sets of data. Those are, there are fits on that. You can determine the lifetimes of each one of those. It turns out there were three nuclear components, so it's rather complex. And that is the 
basically that's the chi of T I was talking about in the time domain, the response function, the Green's function, the delta function response of the of the, the CS2 molecule. And uh, from that, you can and then uh, predict what's going to happen in other experiments. So here is a similar to that first view graph I showed on Daly Mars time. This is the nonlinear refractive index as a function of the year published in literature for carbon disulfide. Notice this semi logarithmic scale here with three orders of magnitude. They're all over the map. But we know that for short pulses, you can dominate it by just the bound electronic response. The nuclear responses can't be, can't be important. And so we got that response function and we calculated what you would see in, for example, a Z scan or any single beam experiment. And that's this blue line. It goes well over, it goes over an order of magnitude change between short pulses and long pulses. And we went back to these data and we looked what pulse width did they use? And then we moved those in this, in this plane to see whether, notice the scatter now is much reduced. There's still a lot of scatter, but it's much reduced from where it was before, all right? And we had done, previous to this beam deflection experiments where we could get this response function, we had done Z scans at many different pulse widths from 30 femtoseconds to 20 picoseconds and two different laser systems, two different laboratories. And we weren't able to understand what was going on until we did the beam deflection experiments, which gave us this blue line prediction. We put the set of data on top of it without, change, without any fitting parameter, not vertical, not horizontal or anything, and look where they sit. Absolutely beautiful fit on there. So we now understand very well carbon disulfide. If you think about it, if you look in the literature, people have been using carbon disulfide as a reference material, but using different pulse widths. And so they, that, you can't do that. But now that we have this curve, we can use it as a reference if we know what our pulse width is, right? So it works very nicely. And I have a very, very industrious uh, graduate student who actually did the, these predictions, did, did experiments on 24 different solvents uh, to give these curves uh, for 24 different solvents. Uh, at linear circular polarization, again, no fitting. Uh, look at long times uh, to, to look at the uh, nuclear responses and no, no, and there's no, no dispersion, which was, was, was predicted. And you can then, if you go and you look here just, and we did a whole bunch of experiments with, with really short pulses because you're dominated by the bound electronic effect down here. And then the nuclear responses start coming in here. But if you do all your experiments down here, really short pulses, you know you're looking at the bound electronic nonlinearity. So that's what we did here to plot out, here's the two photon absorption turning on at 2.5 electron volts. And here's the bound electronic nonlinear refractive index. See, it goes up and it, then it turns rapidly negative. It fits beautifully to a simple, uh, uh, a simple sum over states model uh, and uh, uh, it's a very nice method. So then let's remove the sample in the lab. So no sample. And we'll do this beam deflection experiment. There's the delta E over E from that beam experiment. This is looking at the nonlinear fraction or the nonlinear phase shift as a function of time delay. But we didn't evacuate the lab. There's air in the lab, all right? That's not noise. Let me just look at the third, first uh, 30 picoseconds or so, 50 picoseconds, whatever it is. Here's the bound electronic response because the pulses were only uh, 100 femtoseconds. These are now picoseconds. And you get all these extra things. So what is that? Well, nitrogen and oxygen are polarizable molecules, diatomic molecules, similar to CS2, and they get reorientation in the gas. And so what you're seeing is a, something called recursions. We weren't the first to see these recursions, but, uh, and it's, it's rather simple to see what you're going, doing. This is, this is basically the, the nuclear Raman um, rotational transition. And notice in the frequency domain, you know the Raman spectrum of delta J is plus or minus two. It's kind of an optical cone. So let me come and hit these. This is a two-dimensional analog. Let me hit this with a delta function pulse. Some of the molecules are gonna get hit kicked and they're going to rotate fast because they get pulled into the direction of the polarization of the, of the, of the, uh, the light beam. So you come through here, they start to rotate. But after some period of time, whoa, see that? They sort of rephase and they rephase again and keep going, they rephase again. And that's what you're seeing in, the, uh, in that uh, time domain measurement of the Raman response. So uh, you get those recursions. It's really, really fun physics. Um, but here 
here you hit it with a delta function and you watch what happens. If I Fourier transform this, this spectrum in, in time, I take, just take the Fourier transform, I get the Raman spectrum in terahertz. The blue is the oxygen, the, the red is the, is the nitrogen, and it's basically that optical comb, just like you have for a mode lock laser, right? Except it's not a perfect comb because you have centrifugal distortion. So at high values of J, the centrifugal distortion stretches those molecules and so they're not quite where they were. So the, the comb is slightly distorted. And so that, that actually helps with this decay because the comb is not, uh, is not perfect, but also uh, uh, co uh, collision sunlight does that as well. So, um, you know, really fun physics there and uh, 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 lots of things you can do. And we've done a number of other things with this with look, actually we did CS2 in the gas phase. We looked at the, at the molecular polarizability with these and we can see that you can do the, look at the uh, gas, you can look at the liquid, you can show the molecular polarizability is the same, whether it's in a gas or in a liquid, it says that the molecules around there are not, uh, are not affecting the bound electrons in, in, the, in the material line. So, so uh, fun stuff. So um, I can't read what I read because the stuff is in the way, but uh, Different non I know what I want to say is there are different nonlinear processes that can get confused. And in particular for this chi 3, two photon absorption is the imaginary part of chi 3. Bound electronic two photon absorption has to be ultra fast. That's it. But I showed you that excited state absorption or free carrier absorption looks very similar if you just did a single set of Z scans. That's a chi one chi one, so it's good, that gives you an effective chi three. But it's really a chi one chi one, and people should recognize that. And and you know, it, the publications you're always putting effective this, effective that. Yeah, you know, look at what the physics really is. Now, I didn't talk about it, but also you can have these cascaded second order nonlinearity effects that also mimic chi three uh, with, with materials that are uh, phase matchable. Uh, really neat physics in, in that that I'm not going to talk about. And of course, the two photon absorption with excited state absorption, this is, this is the N is created by two photon absorption generation rates. So that's the imaginary part of chi three. But then there's a, another imaginary part of chi one uh, here because an I squared integral of integral over time of I squared times I. And uh, so in the same thing for nonlinear fractions. So, um, Nonlinear spectroscopy comes of age. There's all sorts of things you do with nonlinear spectroscopy. But for example, Z-Scan sees all the nonlinear absorption process, all the nonlinear refractive process. The experiment I showed on nonlinear uh, uh, beam deflection, it's sensitive to all the nonlinear absorption, which is just the sum of the four digits. This is a, a, just, just a regular uh, excited probe. And it's, and it's sensitive to all the nonlinear refractive process. So you got to know what's going on for whatever pulse width you use. So you need to take great care in the interpretation of that data. And um, that's what keeps me in business, all right? So, so uh, uh, good, fun stuff. And I wanna, I wanna thank uh, Monsieur Shaker Kai, uh, the, the guy who was in the lab doing the, uh, doing the original Z scans. He came up with the name, uh, did, the, did the, uh, the math uh, and, and the like. So, uh, Lots of fun. So thank you very much for, for having me on. Uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have.